So now you're getting out of the county jail. You never went back. How do you? How, how did your life start transitioning away from the gang and becoming who you are now? Well, one of the good things we talked about earlier is that I didn't have no skills. I didn't know what to do, so I worked in factories. Mm-hmm. That's that's what worked. And you know, in those days, LA was the largest manufacturing center in the country, bigger than Chicago, bigger than Detroit. It was huge. Yes. We had steel mills, we had oil refiners, we had garment industry, we had shipyards. We had a lot of industry. We had GM, GM plant. Right. There was one in Van Nuys and then there was one at, at Southgate. Okay. And there was a Ford plant, Pico Rivera. There was all these big, I worked at Bethlehem Steel for That's four right. years. And those jobs, by 1984, they, LA lost 300 plants and then many more after that. They just all fell apart. The deindustrialization yeah, because killed yeah. it. Reagan came in and started pushing the jobs he out did. of the country. Reagan, the, the Republicans that they love so much. They love so much. He got rid of the industry. By the time Reagan and the first Bush got out, all the big jobs were, were Walmart. Mm-hmm. All the good jobs were gone, and now all the big jobs were Walmart, mm-hmm. Kmart, and all those jobs. Yeah. Low paying jobs. Low paying, no unions. You know, we had unions. We had good paying jobs. You could buy a house. Yep. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah. That's what uh, being a steel mill working in an auto plant was like. It was a great thing. And uh, the Mexicans and blacks were barely getting in. Mm-hmm. And we were always oh, laborers. That's a great point. But we were yeah. breaking through the skilled trades for the first time. And then they killed it. And then guess what? Their neighborhoods were left with nothing. And guess who else? That's when the gangs became drug involved. The gangs were the most cohesive group in the neighborhood after the industry left, and they became the, the illicit industry. The economy was drugs, and it seemed to be by design to me. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, wait a minute. I mean, they get rid of these jobs. They get rid of all the organizations that were trying to do something like the Brown Braves, Black yeah. Panthers, all of them, and then the gangs are the only ones that can still keep an economy going, but now it's drugs. drugs. And yeah. sure enough, as you know, crack comes in. It's no accident. Through the Reagan administration, crack comes in at the same time. All this stuff is going on. Yeah, well, yeah it all came in yeah. through higher power. So by the 80s you know? and 90s, you had the highest violence of gangs in the whole country, LA and Chicago being the leading ones. Mm-hmm. All over the country, we, we pe- people killed more for drugs and gangs than ever in our history. In yes, fact, sir. it went down since then. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, they were they were bringing drugs to the CIA, so they were poisoning us. People, yeah. if they don't they're, know they're that stuff, th- they should know that our government played a role in getting that drugs in our neighborhoods, getting them in the, in, into our streets. Uh, they were almost, and you know, I want to say something about it. Um, they weren't rogue agents. They weren't crazy CIA guys. No. They were regular, good Americans, mm-hmm. good church-going people with suits and ties making these decisions. People should know that. Yeah. Because I, I worked on a TV show, Snowfall, and one of the problems I had oh with Snowfall, goodness. I like Snowfall, and I, John um, um, Singleton, mm-hmm. the one of the creators, brought me in. He, he passed, which is sad. He brought me in there. But the, I had an argument with some of the people there saying that they made the CIA guys in that movie and that TV show like was broke, go huh? crazy. He said, they weren't crazy dudes. These were the regular guys. They weren't rogue agents. Yeah. These were the regular American, yeah. good Americans making decisions that ended up impacting. Yeah, rogue agents. If it was rogue agents, they get the money in pocket. That money was going to the Contras. I it mean, was going it was, to the Contras. It's all, it's all noted. It's they all certified. Exactly. That's it's what all, they did. It's all in the, everybody knows it. And if people argue against it, they say, look, you just don't get the facts. The facts are there. I got facts. And not only that, I was a journalist. Okay, when I got out of the industry, finally, I became a writer journalist. That's what helped me. But one of my first assignments was San Bernardino Sun, where all the dry lakes were being used for the planes bringing in the cocaine bricks. Oh, really? That were being turned wow. into I, crack I, in people's I didn't know that. So, what, what, so, how did so as a reporter, I would talk to DEA and sheriff's deputies. Now I'm a reporter. They didn't like me, they didn't trust me, but now I'm a reporter, I'm asking questions. They told me, the DEA in particular, telling me that this is coming from um, Central America through Mexico. That's how the drug cartels got really big in Mexico and coming in to our neighborhood. They were telling me stuff the dea had a terrible relationship with the cia yes and the cia was doing this because they want to stop communism the dea could give a hoot about that they want to stop drugs so there was clashes so and the, the cia, CIA would never gonna, talk the to CIA you was a yeah. higher rank they yeah. were higher rank they wouldn't talk to you they wouldn't nobody would. but i had the a guys including some sheriff's uh, deputies in san Bernardino county which was very big for this stuff telling me this stuff they were bringing in the planes were coming in all the heroin i mean all the cocaine was being bricks 
was being used, send them, ship them out to neighborhoods everywhere. The money was being used to fund the Contras. That I learned even before Gary Webb wrote about them in the San Jose Mercury. Gary Webb. And then I ended up uh, as a freelance writer in Central America during the Contra War. Really? I was there. I got bombed twice, shot at with 50 caliber bullets, <laughs> never got hit, never got har harmed, but I was there. I was in southern Honduras, and I was in Nicaragua. So I can tell you as a fact, not just... I'm just not academic. I know for a fact that our country was involved in this this trade. And at the same time, they're giving mandatory minimums. They're locking us up. So that's, if that's you look right. at it, it's a perfect storm. They they drug us. They it. make us fight one another. And they lock us up. And, and they're making money all the way around. The largest uh, investment in prisons in the history of the world wow. was during that time. And gangs were part of it, and everybody that was played into it. Again, I, I I go into prisons, I talk to these guys, and I just say, listen, I get I get what happened, I get the system is, but don't forget, we played ourselves, yes, sir. So, Some so of us did, played into it. How did you get off of heroin? Because heroin's a hard drug to, oh, to kick. Dude, it was all cold turkey. Oh, tur you didn't go through any withdrawals there, there or anything? There was no. Oh yeah. Yeah, withdrawals. Yeah. It's the worst <laughs> thing. There was no re rehabilitation. There was no recovery programs in the body. There was nothing. Yeah. The only thing you could do is go to the uh, general hospital to get tested for a, uh, hep, C hep C because everybody was worried about that. And I would go get my test just to see if I had it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that they would do. There was no drug program, there was treatment. Now there is, I guess, I get it, there's all over. But in that time, you just, the only way to get out was cold turkey. And that's how yeah. I had to do it. And it's painful. Mm -hmm. But I was fortunate that I did it with guys in the county jail who knew what they were doing. The very same guys that were going to give me the drug. Yeah. Where the guys help me help get me. out of it. Now, do, do you yeah. also factor because you were part of a movement that's never really uprose again, the Chicano movement? Yeah, it, it was, was strong. Big, it seemed like big. it was a lot of love. Do you factor all this drugs and gang violence into the destruction of the Chicano movement? I think it played a role just like it did a role with the black movement at the time. Uh, remember Huey Newton? Yes, great person. He became a crackhead. It, it, it took heroin and crack to get rid of a lot of people. Gil Scott Heron, one of the great poets, singers, writers, became a crackhead. Richard Pryor, one of the best voices in comedy about politics and change, my favorite comedian, crack. In other words, the drugs, um, the, the destruction of those groups, AIM, Black Panthers, Brown Berets, they were all undermined. You couldn't organize anymore. The organizations were getting thrown off. Uh, all of that, like you say, a perfect storm all happened. And then drugs comes in, and even when you were the most political, you get caught up. Now, not everybody get caught up. Obviously, there's people that I think got bought into the system. They got our activists, and then they found a little bit of money. They're doing well, then they dropped the, the ball. I think others um, just gave it up for whatever reason. Some got into drugs. Me, my wife, and a few other activists never stopped. <laughs> no, I'm not. We kept struggling through everything, Movimiento, even when the Chicano movement really wasn't the thing no more, we still kept the Movimiento spirit. We doing everything we did, including 20 years ago, doing Tia Chucha at Centro Cultural, our bookstore, culture center, carrying that spirit all the way through. And that, that's in Silmar, right? That's in Silmar, yeah. yeah. I, I, we that keep hearing about this, right? Yeah, the books are free today. guys got to go. I, I recommend everybody go to Tia Chucha. It's and been around for 20 years. It's in Silmar. It's a big cultural space. We have the only bookstore for half a million people the only movie house for half a million people, the only place where you can get music, dance, theater, writing, all kinds of arts, painting, it's there. We also go into the prisons and we go into the juvenile halls and the probation camps as well as parole housing with artists and poets and theater people to work with them. So, yeah, it's still going on over 20 years. Dia Chuches. Yeah, yeah. And that's in Silmar. It's in Silmar. Go and, yeah, it's, it's right there on Glen Oaks and Hubbard in the, where the Food for Less is right next to the Food for Less there. Okay. So I would tell, tell people, go to uh, T-I-A-C-H-U-C-H-A.org. Mm -hmm. Get the address, get the, uh, the programming, everything we're doing. Uh, come by. You'll love it, man. We had a grand opening because now we're in our third or fourth space, the bigger space, three times bigger than the last wow. space. We had that's 500 cool. people come through. It was really beautiful. Cool. So, yeah. So, how do we? Well, no. Before I ask you that, back in the days when the Chicano movement was real strong in the late sixties, early seventies, right? Yeah. How were the artists that were Chicanos? Did they support it a lot, like the singers, comedians? So, everything? along with the movement was all this art, because as you know, murals, artists, especially East LA, but even in Pacoima, other places, there was artists coming out of the woodwork, man, 
Mirrors was a big deal. We also had a lot of bands come out because uh, the bands used to be like the Midnighters and, you know, uh, Cannibal and the Headhunters. Then they became El Chicano and then they became Malo and they became Tierra wow. and yeah. Los Lobos. In other words, they were more like our, our, our culture. They were more right. conscious. Um, and also poets. There was a lot of poetry. I got into poetry because I started seeing Jose Montoya, who was the godfather of Chicano poetry. And he's passed now, but he was amazing. He was like our own people. And then also the black poets and Puerto Rican poets. All the, all the voices that were coming out of these str urban struggles were all there. And I became a poet because I heard them. I saw them. I got to meet them. And that got me thinking, I can do that, you know. So yeah. it was a great time for all the arts. But then again, all of it got crushed. You know, after a while, even murals were outlawed. I don't know if you know that you no, could you, in the state LA city, which used to be the mural capital of the world, uh, outlawed murals for many, many years. Really? Only recently it got okay to do murals. Yeah. So it killed off the mural movement movement. People did it on the side, the graffiti yeah. camp and gra big, nice graffiti yeah. pieces, but now you had to do it like an outlaw. You yeah. had to sneak in and spray <laughs> and then get out, you know? So that's the world that uh, art. Ended up it seems like art was bringing all colors together. It brought all kinds of people, man. Art unites. Art is transformative. That's why we do it in the prisons and everything, because art really helps you change. It helps you think about being creative in the midst of chaos. We don't know how to do that, and that's important to me because it's all chaotic. The world's chaotic. To me, the way out is not to create another order so much; it's to be creative, and then see what kind of shape you can make out of that. Why, why do you think now in 2022 there is so much division amongst Rasa itself? You know, again, I think it has to do with everything that happened that splintered us. Again, some people did better than others. Um, some people started thinking, I'm better than you because you're recently arrived, which is silly. Yes. Um, you know, you're undocumented. I don't, now you're not my family no more. Yes. I mean, the people started dividing themselves the way the American people Layers, society is layered in this country, you know. Classism. White supremacy is still there. Class is still very important in this country. People don't want to talk about it, but there is a class society, there's a racial divide society, and we've always had it. That's what the young people are reminding us. It's always been this way. You're never going to say, when they say make America great again, but when was it ever great? It was always carrying this seed of division and racial conflict and class division. It's always been there. Now I hope we get more conscious, we're more aware, and we can actually begin to do something about it. That's what my struggle is now. Do you believe that we should put some pressure on some of our you know, TV stars, some of our singers? Because it seems to me, as... I've been doing this for like four years now, right? They're very scared. They're shy away from any problem that has to do with Rasa. When it came to like the BLM movement, they were all over. It. They yeah. were all over because it was popular. But, you know, it, it seems like the character of somebody is when it's not popular is when you do something. You're it seems right. like, and it seems like yeah. our people just don't want to stand. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's one of the reasons why I'm running for governor. Because, again, it goes to politics, too. We've had a lot of our hint and now in office. Um, many of my like and respect, I don't want to knock them all down, but I don't think they're in general taking on these issues the way they should. They kind of fall into a complacency. You know what I'm saying? Yes. They get comfortable, yeah. pretty soon, you know, hey, uh, I'll get yeah. by you, we'll get by. They, they don't play the role what they should be, which is really voicing our issues, our concerns, and real solutions to real problems. Yes, One of the reasons I'm running for governor, and I'm running from a grassroots level, I'm not, there's no corporate donations and nothing, we're gonna do it grassroots, is we need those voices yes, sir. to say, we, we need the real answers. Why is there homes, LA homelessness? There shouldn't be homelessness, but it, all that perfect storm we talked about helped create the homeless situation yes. where people were being pushed out of the neighborhood. Gentrification, all these issues came in, and uh, drugs coming in, all these issues that we're facing. The mental illness is based on the world that we're in. Okay, Lewis. Driving them th out. This is where we're going into the governor polit political yeah. section, right? This is where we're not friends anymore, right? Now. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> this, you don't, is, like, poli you don't uh, like politics? Oh, no, I, oh, no, 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 no. I love uh, politics, uh, my man. <laughs> but this is where we get, since you're yeah. running for governor, yeah. right? This, you're throwing your hat in the ring. You got to be asked the tough questions, right? There you go. Okay, there so let's go. start off. <laughs> Homelessness. Yeah. What is your uh, solution to what we got going on? And I'll true because my not my solution. When I see homelessness, I don't see it quite the way you see it. Okay. I do agree with yes, 
America definitely had a huge role in it, had a problem with it. Mm-hmm. But now it's gotten to the point where the majority of people out there are not homelessness, they're drug addicts. And I think that the underlying problem of being drug addicts is not even being discussed by any politician. They always say homelessness, and I believe they say it for two reasons. The Democrats say it because they don't want to say it's drug addicts, and the and even the Republicans will say homeless new because they want to build more because they say, hey, no, because we need more build more housing, we need more housing, we need more housing. So it's kind of both parties are using it to bamboozle the people. So and, and they don't get results. And we don't so, get results. So I say it's intertwined. So it's intertwined in that um, th- many more drug addicts, many more mentally ill people. We don't have mental facilities and help in this city in the state we don't have enough of it like i said when i was growing up there wasn't even recovery now there is but it, to me it's a whole industry that not necessarily resolving the problem you got more people on drugs than ever before now you got crystal meth there was drugs now that never yeah. existed yeah. how can they have a war on drugs and drugs get worse than they were when when they first started the war mm-hmm. so to, mo- to me it's again by design that people are just being fed the worst parts of it the other side of it there was a terrible housing crisis all the way through, but in 28, we had the mortgage financial crisis. Mm-hmm. It led to a lot of people losing homes, a lot of renters being thrown out. At the same time, as you know, the gentrification came in. So to me, it's intertwined. It's intertwined with a real de- uh, design to get rid of poor people, get rid of people from our neighborhoods. As you know, we talk about Highland Park, Echo Park, parts of the Valley. We're looking at Watts, all these communities, a lot of gentrification. Black and brown people, poor people are being pushed out. They're going to the deserts, Lancaster, Palmdale, they're over yeah, they're on the there. Indian Empire. Yeah. They're all being pushed out, and now they're making it almost hard for anybody to survive. So I think it's an intertwined issue of all of it. I agree with you. It's not just one or the other. I've been in those encampments, and you're right. I have seen a lot of drugs. Oh, I can take you all over. We got them all over here, man. But a lot of homelessness, what people don't understand, is actually people living in in garages they're not really in, in the cabinets a lot of them like for example Pacoima has an elementary school that 25 percent of those kids are homeless but they're living in rvs they're living in campers they're living in garages in other words they're not necessarily in the encampments well see so it, not, not to cut yeah. you off but those people yes they're homeless yeah. those people yes they need help I, yeah. I i i think we need to separate the good apples with the bad and people might say they're they're human yeah they're human beings but by the time you become a tecato by the, con- the time you become a crystal meth guy like you say you won't go back to the barrio and mess because they're doped out you so can't if you got guys out here in encampments they're all doped out the reason they don't want to go into these rehab places because they can't get high anymore yeah so i think if if we can separate the class and say listen that person has a family they just can't afford, yeah, I'm all for low housing. I'm all for that. Yeah, yeah. But I think if, if we don't separate the, the drug addicts from the homeless, it just, it, it turns a lot of voters into, no, I'm not putting, in other words, you as a governor, are you, would you expect us to put more money into this? Because we had Measure H already, billions. Uh, the governor now is trying to put $12 billion. Would you be for adding another $12 billion to the, to the budget? Well, I don't think it's about adding more money. If it is, let's do it and make sure it works. But the problem is that you're adding all this money and it's not working. No, you're just throwing money at so drug addiction. That's that what it work. is. So what I would say is you have to do the treatment. Treatment on demand. It's, it's a very important issue because I couldn't have it growing up and barely doesn't happen now. You got to make sure that people get treated. I would say most of them, even if they're treated, even if they're on drugs. What if they don't want treatment? Well, if they don't want it, then there's not much you could do. Well, there is. How about but, this? How about this? How about you start enforcing the laws they enforced in the 80s, the 90s, mostly the 90s, yeah. loitering laws, where if you're out there, you're loitering, you're going to get arrested. But instead of going to jail or prison, we have encampments that is going to treat you. Well, I would appreciate that. In other words, instead of putting them in jails and prisons, because we know they're, no, filled, they're a bunch of drug addicts, let's get them the help they need. Let's get them in places where they can get help. And, you know, I saw this in Europe. I go to Europe a lot. And they actually have... Um, if you go to some of these places in Europe, they have places like that. You can That's actually sh- you can actually shoot up heroin, but it's clean. It's not the street stuff. You can shoot it up clean, healthy with a nurse. But right next to it is a treatment center if you want it. Yeah. If you don't want it, they can't force it to go in there, but they but make it there. very clear. It's there. You want it, you go. If you want to keep using it, come here. Don't do it in the street. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's actually lowered uh, the whole heroin population in particular but they got crystal meth they got all these issues every drug addict is given that opportunity you know to get the drugs they're clean 
if you so you don't get in the street because the street stuff is bad news. I mean, the crystal meth's got fentanyl. People are oh, they're dying. Going, they're going crazy. They're going crazy. Stuff. You know, yeah. so and you, even the heroin isn't really heroin. You go take heroin, you don't know what kind of junk they got in there, yeah, and anymore. people are ODing on junk. So the point is, you you can do that if you put the money there. Not just say I'm, I'm going to put millions of dollars and just keep a bureaucracy going and not really help nobody. So I, I think what you're saying it's a multi pronged approach, Absolutely. and that's what it should be. That's Get the true. people that need housing, put them in housing. The kids that are living in garages or in their RVs, yeah. get them housing, yes. man. Absolutely. And then the there's people that need damage. treatment, they should get treatment. And you know, there's people in the world that can show us. We yeah. act like we're we we got all the answers. Go. I've been there. I've seen these mm -hmm. places. Uh, they got answers. They give people help. They've lowered the, the problems of drugs um, much better than what we've done. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I got a whole list for you, man. There you go. Really? That, was go just, that, that was just that level was just one. Little, we got yeah. about level 10 right here. Yeah. Do you support Gascon as a DA? Oh, he's I actually do support him. And this is the only reason why I support him. I get some of the issues that he's confronting. Uh, the reason why I support him is because I really don't believe that the uh, a prison system, the way it's set up. And I've been working in prisons for 40 years. And I go in there as a poet, as a writer, I go in there, do healing circles. I, you know, I've been up and down the state, 18 states, going to prisons. I think the mass incarceration system, as we pointed out, is part of the perfect storm. I think people need to be provided with a lot of help okay. and assistance and resources. You know, remember I mentioned the mentor? Mm -hmm. He gave me the tools, connections, and resources so I can save myself. He didn't say, I'm saving you. Yeah. He wasn't going to do that. But when you save yourself, you start owning your life. That's what we got to help people to own their life. Not just, I'm going to help you, and then now you're dependent on me. Mm -hmm. You know, dependence is not just drugs. There's dependence on programs. There's dependence on all kinds of ways. And I think all of that is not what we're talking about. So, But what, what do you say, like Gascon, he's... Uh He's he's taking the gang enhancements off. He's taking yeah. mandatory saying He's doing yeah. all this, but now that you see that he's done all this, all the guy, a lot of guys in prison are are now getting out of yeah. out of prison. Crime is going through the but roof. What's once. missing? You, you you're already pointing out what's missing. What's missing? What happens when these guys get out? They got well. They got nothing going. On. Exactly. So it isn't. Yes, just get them out of prisons. Well, prisons. Well, actually, right now, know. no. Actually, right now, there's a lot of work. This is it's the 4.1 <laughs> million people quit their jobs, and it's hard for me to keep people working because people don't want to work because the government keeps giving out free handouts. Well, let's just say this, and I I think it's again trying to own your life. Give people the tools to build their own lives and the communities that they're in. Just give us the tools. And you know, something that came out of the uprising was that give us the hammers and the nails, and we would rebuild our communities. Nobody took. I saw that. I saw paper, bloods and crips, unity. That the one good thing that came out of all that, yeah. and yet nobody took it seriously. That's what they needed. Give us the hammers and the nails. But there's jobs to be done. There's roads Absolutely. to be fixed. Absolutely. There's so much to be done. I would keep people working. I love working because it teaches you to be disciplined, self-disciplined, yes. to get up in the morning, to get the job done, to maybe not want to be on drugs all the time. Mm -hmm. If you're idle, you got nothing to do. And if you get out of prison and you don't help, these guys with anything to do. They're warehousing them in shelters. I don't know if you know, there are yes. huge shelters that these guys yeah. parolee housing that's just awful. Um, said, no, no. So getting them out is only part of the problem. What happened to the rest of it? What happened to that support? What happened to the ability to give these people skills so they can get a job? You know, well, and, they're, they're, you know. the, I think that th uh, the thing is they need, it's when they come out, a lot of times they come out with a certain mentality and they don't have yeah. people skills, unfortunately, because yeah. I see it all the time. I hire guys coming of out of prison, right? Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them, if you, a job will change your life. No yeah, doubt about yeah, yeah. it. A, a job will change your life. But I, th I think also we have a different level of gang member that we did from the seventies. Yeah. Now we got now we're back to 80, 90s type gang members. So what do you tell somebody like with Gascon, somebody that killed your son or daughter that's innocent, and Gascon is a 14-year-old guy, what do we do with a 14-year-old murder nowadays? You tell the, the people, oh, we're going to let him go in four or five years? Yeah, well, that's, I think, where the gaps exist, and I think where you're pointing out, and I'm totally understanding that. You just can't let these guys out without providing that uh, a net to really help them. How much time do we give a 14-year-old killer? Well... Here's the thing. Is it a matter of time? I think that if you, for example, when I was growing up, it didn't take very long for me. And I got, I'm one example. All it took was, I, I call it not being scared straight, being cared straight. Nice. Somebody cares for you enough. Some people like me would, 
would change your life. Because I was a murderous, homicidal kid. I hate to say that. I yeah. was. I was suicidal, homicidal. I, did. I, I didn't care if I died. I didn't care who died with me. That was my attitude. Uh, something, it took a lot, but it took one person with whatever lack of resources he had, he made it happen. Can you imagine if we could replicate that in every neighborhood for every kid? If every young adult would mentor a younger adult, you know, just mention just one person. Can you imagine if we trained mentors, anybody, a father could also mentor some kid. Your kid's uh, hanging out with his kids in trouble. Instead of, don't bring him out here. What does he need? He don't got a father. Yeah, mentors change lives. Maybe we can do that. So I would work on training a whole group of our community to work with these kids. Mentoring, eldership, all these things that we're missing, I would work on making sure that we have them. So it isn't just throwing money, like you're saying, just throwing money at the problem yeah. and walk away. You're actually trying to establish something that's own, that's older, that's sustainable. And well, we've seen it when it does work. I've yes. done it. But it's never enough resources. A lot of people don't even believe it works. I've seen it work. Yeah. Bring these mentors together, teach them, train them, get them out there. They're the members of the community. You see them, you learn to respect them. You, you, they don't disrespect the kids, but they don't take a bunch of nonsense from them either. You know, you know how it is. So, that's, so, that's the way. so I got to ask you again, how much time do you give a 14-year-old gangbanger that kills an innocent woman or, or guy? So here's the thing. Right now, because if people you, are going to want to know this. You yeah, yeah, I know. That's a good question. If you do... Um, and I think I saw this in Europe. They give you, they don't give, most of it is very little sentencing. Uh, they give um, a murderers maybe three to seven years. Oh, Jesus. Crime will go through the roof over here. But you know why it works over there? Why? Because in three to seven years, they give a person ability to tr shift their life, shift what they were doing. I was surprised when I was in Italy and they had these uh, juvenile offenders came to me. They brought them out of the juvenile facility to come to where I was at. And I had a Spanish language, a Spanish escort, a priest escorting him. So I could talk to him and say, I can't speak Italian, but I can speak Spanish. And I says, well, these guys might be the lightweight kids. He says, oh, no, we have a kid here that stabbed one of his fellow students. We have another kid that was working for a local mafia and bombed somebody's house and killed a couple of people. These aren't lightweights. I said, well, how do you let them out? Because we teach them how to live, how to think about living, what to do, and also that if you do good, you're going to be rewarded and you're going to be given support and, and, and you're going to be given opportunities. These are the kids that done well and we give them these opportunities. And I ask them, do any of them escape? Not one escape. We've never had anybody escape. In other words, it's a whole different attitude change. And I think, unfortunately, we don't got that to change, so it's going to be problematic because well, we can't I, see changing. I, I think also kids. we live in a different world in over there uh, uh, we live in california it's, it's almost like you know it, the gang culture is so embedded it's really huge and, 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 and that has a lot to do with it but it. it does have a lot to do with mentoring father families and yeah I, I would love to have more stuff in the community out here i, I, I even that do that when i was in the prisons I, I stopped going with the pandemic and i'm not going back because i'm doing so much other stuff yeah. but i was teaching creative writing but i wasn't i was teaching creative thinking creative living mm -hmm. I, I use creative writing as a way to get in, because the prison ain't gonna tell me, uh, they're gonna say, you can't do creative thinking, creative living, they don't know what that is, but creative writing. But I was teaching them to rethink themselves and their lives. I was getting them through writing to go back and what have you done in this world? Go back and look at everything. Look at the patterns of your own life. How do you shift those patterns? There's ways of doing that. And a lot of those guys were older guys, lifers, some of them 20, 30 years, and they were coming at me like, we don't really want to be part of this world no more. Some of them were never getting out of prison. They yeah. wanted to get out. I said, well, then we'll learn. We'll teach. We'll help each other. I was training a lot of guys in the Pintas to do this. And then, of course, other people come over to the programs, recovery, yeah. I mean, what do you call it, restorative justice programs, all kinds of other things. Uh, it's possible, but again, there's not enough. Most prisons don't have any programming. The few that do, I got in on them, uh, yeah. but most of them don't. And so you got guys serving many years in prison that aren't giving any help. Now, for some people, to be honest with you, prison is the best thing that ever happened to them. Yeah. So you have to yeah. take that account. My, my son says that. You know, he's, true. he's always pointing out that he did close to, he did 13 and a half year stretch. He did a little bit of time stretch. before that. And uh, what happened is um, he changed his life in there. If the issue was that if he stayed in the street, he would be dead or people would be killed. And so in many ways, prison was good. But I think the question or the answer wasn't so much the prison, but being able to be removed in another situation where you can start being seen and looked at and also see yourself. That's important. 
And he did it on his own because we helped him. Because I think if we didn't help him the way we could, he might not have seen it. But I, that, I think also with, when it comes to like when you're, uh, I mean, back of a better word, gangster criminal running the streets and all that, or a drug addict, a lot of times it's just up to that individual to finally say, you know what, I'm tired of this lifestyle. Yeah, that's happened to me. You know, and again, I... I was tired seven years of drugs. That's not a long time. I know oh, guys no, 20, 30 that's years. That's a long time to be But for, some, for me, it was a long time, and it was like I was tired. of. Now, I wasn't tired. I kept drinking. People do that. They find a way to justify, and I'm drinking. Now I'm 20 years afterwards, I'm drinking. I'm realizing that's I'm tired of for this. Another. I'm starting realizing I'm tired of all of this. I'm tired of the drinking. I'm tired of the drugs. I've always had a crutch. I always had an excuse. I always had, I was an addict thinking it's person. It's birthday party. It's Saturday. It's, <laughs> it's Friday. Something. It's New Year's. It's Christmas. So you're right. It, it is hard. Now, the longer you're in it, the harder it is, but I think it could help. It could work. Um, for me, it was, um, I got into a recovery program at the time there was in Chicago. I got into a really good one. And then I decided to go to my own uh, spiritual roots as an indigenous Chicano. You know, my mother's Tarahumara native from Chihuahua. Your, probably, your family's probably yeah. got Chihuahua. Uh, if they're from Chihuahua, they got Tarahumara in them. I know my family does. My mom who would say, oh, somos Tarahumaras, you know, and she knew. And I've gone down there. So I went to my indigenous spiritual practices. That's me. I'm not proselytizing i'm not trying to convert nobody uh-huh. but any spiritual practice that teaches you deep and it could be christian it could be yeah. buddhist yes. it could be all kinds of things will help and that's what helped me finally turning my life around but how do you get these 14 year old kids to do that you give well, them say say a 14 yeah. year old kid goes to prison for murder you give them say 15 years you know at 15 years that could change his whole life to yeah. be institutionalized and, and that's come right out. Yeah, well, you know where do you catch him so, to be like okay, his, you you give him instead of giving him fifteen, you give him ten because at ten he'll still be like, all right, I'm gonna change my life now. I think that's you know? there's a time where you can do some good, three to seven, even ten years. Yeah, it pulls you away, but if you do well with them, really teach them, really the work with them, it, it, do it well, yeah. they'll come out. My son did thirteen and a half, but he came out yeah. positive. He came out strong. Um, it may not happen to a lot of people, but again. There's nothing going on for and them. And then what do you tell the family of the victim? Like, you know what? You know, they want to see this kid in for part the rest of, of his the life. Part of the restorative justice concept is you involve the victim in, the, in it. And I'll give you an example. The Navajos do this. And I know I spent a lot of time with Navajo. Uh, a Navajo elder adopted my wife 25 years ago. And we've been part of their family ever since. But they do very strong restorative justice. I work with a murdering kid that was 16. Mm-hmm. He murdered a Navajo police officer. He was on crystal meth. The families knew each other because in the in Navajo Reyes, everybody knows each other, at least those communities, they know yeah. each other. So the family was pissed mm-hmm. off. He murdered their son, and, yeah. and, and this kid was... Uh, but he uh, told people that the book that helped him was always running. Mm-hmm. So they got me involved, and I started writing them in the jail and everything. And the, and the tribe got involved because they wanted to bring him to the state prison system and get him for death penalty. Mm-hmm. But he's on the res. And they fought to keep it federal. But then they also said, but we want to control what happens in the federal level. So working with the victims Mm -hmm. who were pissed off, but they knew all knew each other. They all had to have agreement. It was acuerdos, as they call them. Mm -hmm. Only they have different names than the Navajo, but acuerdos for us. Mm -hmm. Agreement was keep him in prison until he was 21, but help him. Everybody said, if you help him, give him treatment, give him help, do whatever he needs to do, help him. And at 21... Let him out, and we'll keep an eye on him. They get him a job. I said, get him a job. They got him a job and help him out. He's been out for 20 years now, and he's good. Good stuff. He's good. And I'll tell you one thing else about him. I didn't know. He wrote me a letter, and I put it in one of my books, Hearts and Hands, which I recommend people read that book. In there, he says, I never told anybody why I was so hateful. When he was seven, three years old, and when he was seven years old, he had a three-year-old brother. They were playing by themselves in the res, and somehow they found a gun. Mm-hmm. No one knows where. He accidentally shoots his brother and kills him. So he never got a chance to talk about this. He got taken away from his house. He was put in institutions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We, they were setting him up to be this. And I'm not trying to blame him totally for, blame the system for him killing this guy, but you can see where the setup was. You get some understanding to yeah. what You get the understanding. And then when I read that story and I realized, boy, what this kid was carrying. And that came out of the treatment they were giving him, where he could talk about it, where he could write about it, and everything, all the abuse he got institutionally, all this stuff. So you can see how he was going to end up this way. It all helped him. Um, and, and there was, it's possible. It isn't easy. No, but, totally. but what we're well, doing now is not working. Whatever's I, doing. I, I can agree on that. Yeah. I can definitely kids, agree on I that. I mean, you got yeah. a 14-year-old kid, even myself, I got tried as an adult, and I was already going to 
prison. Yeah. You know, that's not a place for a 15 year old kid. Or well, as you know, kid. prisons are, are university causes. That's what yeah. we learned no, the, how the hardcore sure. way. There's something needs to change. You learn a lot in prisons, but you're not necessarily learning the right things. Yeah, but even the juvenile hall systems, I oh. mean, these kids are running, the, the staff isn't even running them no, no more. Right, these kids are running Let's shift this a little bit. Um, illegal immigration. Well, Okay, <laughs> I, I'm obviously for the support of the undocumented people. I believe that people who come here, especially DACA students, had no choice. Give them a break, let them be citizens. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I don't think that um, we should treat these people less than anybody else. That's my family, especially when it comes to the border. The problem is, though, is those countries that they come from, and I've been there, I've been to El Salvador. Yeah. I've been to Honduras. I've been. Uh, I've spent a whole month there working with abandoned kids. I've been to Nicaragua. They're all got terrible problems that if they don't get resolved, they're going to keep coming over here. They want to stay in their countries. Yeah. yeah. Parts of Mexico, they can't. So, in all those countries, they came out of civil war, really terrible civil war. Yeah. And then they had the worst poverty you can imagine. Honduras, after all, Haiti is the poorest country in the country, yeah. in the world, in the in the Americas. And then you had corruption. The corruption from Mexico all the way down. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying everybody's corrupt. I'm saying enough government. of them. Yeah. Government is enough corruption that you can't trust nobody. Can so people cannot survive. And then you got this ecological problem where, like in Guatemala, 60% of the arable land was taken over by um, the fruit companies, mm -hmm. the big companies. People couldn't live anymore. And then when those companies left, the land is now ar not arable. They can't work them. They're not surviving. So. You create it again, another perfect storm, if you want to call yeah, it. There's no middle class. And you're no, either poor or you're rich. You got poor and you got the rich hit hiding it. I was in Ciudad Juarez in 2010 when it was the murder capital of the world. Mm -hmm. They had the rich people, and they weren't really rich, they were middle class. You would, you know, mm -hmm. hiding behind barbed fence with guards and everything. Mm -hmm. And the rest was these slums. As you know, yeah. the slums got worse. I, I was I remember the Cartolandias they used to have in Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez, but now the worst the slums are just spread out from people coming over Mexico and uh, Central America just trying to get over here. So we created a terrible storm that's not helping them and not helping us uh, as a world. The world uh, see what happens with nation states is we start imprisoning people within the nations. It used to be when you had migrancy. You migrated because of famine, because there wasn't enough food. You can go to another place, another part of the world where you can survive until that gets bad and you can move and then yeah. let that place get better. We can't do that now. We create refugees. Mm -hmm. And the refugees come from all over the world, southern hemisphere world. So you got people from Arab countries, from Africa, from Asian countries, poorest countries. Yeah, they're now, all during, during Europe. Europe is the same thing. Europe is no longer white people. It's a mix of the world is all right. there. The U.S. is a mix of the world. and But instead of being like, okay, we're going to be striding borders and everything else, which just all just create more refugees and creates more problems, we got to find a way to uh, work again both ends of it. What do we do in those countries to give these people the ability to survive so they won't have to leave their countries? Yeah, because they don't want to leave. And then do what we can here so when the people do make it, we don't treat them like criminals and treat them badly. Some of them are held in detention camps five, ten years, and they haven't even committed a crime other than they crossed the border. And even when they try to be asylum seekers, which is legal, mm -hmm. they don't give them that legal option. Mm -hmm. So that's my sense of it. We've created uh, monsters of our own making. It's, it's also you know? the, the corporate greed. Is, is The corporate greed is awful because people don't realize that many of those people were thrown off their land because of the corporations came in, took over. Yes. If you go to the borders, the Miqueladoras, right? They came in there, they hired these people, very little money, this, it's just exploitation. And uh, and they couldn't survive off the land, so now they're working in maquiladoras. And then when those maquilas lose their jobs, they got nothing. Yeah. What are they going to do? They have to come over. So again, it's all creating, I say by design, all creating a situation, monsters of our own making. We call them monsters. We call uh, all the gang kids monsters, and I, I get it. They can be. I know I was one of them. They could be pretty monstrous, but we created the situations that they would exist and happen and keep perpetuating. What do we do to get on the front end of it? Not the back end, the front end, foundational, basic st structural things. Structural things have to happen in those countries. You can't just band-aid it. You can't just fix it on the top. You gotta have structure. I, I wish there was a, a cloning machine so I can clone you and put you in every barrio from here to oh, New man. York. <laughs> because 
what you got, you, you do. You, you, you have that energy. You have that solution. You have that patience. You have that compassion. And you got the love, and, and you can feel it in the air. Right? Yeah, and it comes from growing up in those places. You know, I've been there. Like, I, I've been in the prisons and afterwards. I didn't go to prison, but I've been going there. I go into the, I've been to those countries. Mm-hmm. I've, been to the, I've been all over Mexico. I've, been to, I've seen, like, again, talking about Ciudad Juarez, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen what we do as a country is not helping. I see what we do when the gang kids come down there and all they do is get, is get worse because there's no jobs for them. There's nothing for them to do. Not all the gang kids that have been deported down to those countries are bad, but when they have nothing to do, what do they have? Yeah, they have they, what they learned. They're worse our, than us over yeah, here. Yeah. They, they learned we from us. It. We, yeah. ex- we exported, exported gangs. that problem. Yes, we did. And they learned yeah. from us and they took it to other levels over yep. there. I get it. We don't do the kind of stuff that I see in those countries. Yeah. But we gave them the training in our prison system, in our juvenile facilities. We gave them those training. Yeah. So I think, again, intertwine, they're all intertwined. It's fine answers that can bring both into it together. So, so before we start wrapping this thing up, uh, you got any poems you bring? Yeah, I actually do. Come on now. Because I am Come a poet. Come on now. I, I am the, the, the I'm, I'm governor. I'm comfortable right here. Poet gov- uh, a governor. Uh, how do you say? Poet <laughs> governor. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do this right now. So <laughs> I'm going to just maybe just read one because I, I, I know we got a lot going on. So let me just read. Take your time. Let's take your time, brother. You know, I'm see if I can find a poem that I wrote for the campaign. Um, oh boy, maybe I can't uh, find it. Oh, While you're looking for that, I got a question. Um, yeah, yeah. When did you realize that you couldn't actually write a book? Like, were you like in the neighborhood and you were just thinking like, oh, I could just, your mind just starts going, like not really realizing I started writing in juvenile hall and in jail. Uh-huh. And I was a terrible writer, but I just love to read. I think what helped me when I was homeless, I spent many hours in the public library. Honestly, I love books. Yeah, that's how I learned English because I couldn't speak English going to school. I learned it. Well, you watch TV, you learn it. But I read books. I love books. I had this love of books. Turns out my my dad loved books, mm-hmm. and then turned out a grandfather wrote books in Mexico. Mm-hmm. He was part of the Mexican Revolution, so it's in my blood. Somehow it's in me, and somehow books became my life. And then I said, so now I'm you're the be public library. Now you see your own books there. Yeah, how does that feel? there you go. That's the important part. That that's transformation. I would go to the libraries. You'll never see a Garcia or a Sanchez or yeah. Rodriguez. Now you got all these books from people like us that are writing too. And so that's what's the important. Theme, the theme yeah. for the poem. <laughs> so the poem, I'm going to read you this poem. I just wrote it for the campaign. California, a marvelous state with every terrain possible. California with climates and natural environments unrivaled in the world. And yet with poison and degraded landscapes ecosystems scarring our land, what wildfires and drought made worse by global heating, a destabilized climate threatening conditions for life. All preventable. California, a wonderfully diverse state with a rich blend of cultures and and peoples with wisdoms and talents from the indigenous and around the world. California, a land plenty with massive industries and still there's widespread poverty, hunger, homelessness, there's vast wealth and power concentrated in the hands of a few, while many of us barely subsist. Our governance, our body politic, too but often fails us, hijacked by corporate and political entities organized against the rest of us. There's a winner-take-all electoral process that underrepresents our voices, our hopes, our dreams. We've been betrayed by an economic system that prioritizes profit, not people, rewards greed instead of meeting human need. It's time for change. Time for a new California. Mm-hmm. 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 So, thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. So we're going to start wrapping this bad boys yep. up. I want to thank you guys for tapping in here. I will put the links to all his, uh, to the, the campaign where you can donate, where you yep. can get in touch with this whole party. I want to thank you so much for coming over here and just yeah, sharing yourself right. with us and your whole story, man. And yeah. I'm going to give you the last word. You can look into the camera. And give your shout outs. Lewis. Well, just to say, let's, let's make a difference now. Let's make it happen. I've always been against uh, odds. People say the odds are against me, but let's change those odds. Let's make it winnable now for sure for everyone.